tells us about freedom of speech. And I've asked, asked students to read and say that statement over and over again. And it's a really important thing, I think, for us to do as a centerpiece for the course. And so um, uh, I think I will just stop with the introductions right now. The, uh, about the housekeeping tonight, we actually want this to be a, a discussion. We want people to speak up and, and talk, talk to us. And so I have a few guiding questions that I'm going to uh, pose as a way of helping us to kind of uh, do this in an orderly way. And I'm gonna give uh, Dr. Altman the first uh, opportunity to respond to each one of those questions. And then I hope all of you will jump in as much as you would like to do. Also, I don't think we've started uh, recording this session but I hope we can do that. Um, Start a recording. It is, it is recording? Yes. Yes, Very sure. good. Thank you so much for that. No problem. Yeah. So, um, so, so here we go. Is everybody ready? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, first, the first question I want to throw out there is how important do you believe? And I'll say this to you, Dr. Altman. Mm -hmm. How important do you believe it is for master's librarians to take a course devoted to this topic of intellectual freedom? And can you explain your answer to us? Sure, sure, absolutely. First of all, thank you all for having me. It's a privilege and a, a pleasure to speak with you all this evening. And um, I'm glad that so many of you were able to show up this evening. Um, and for those who are not here, hopefully you can watch the recording later on. Um, as Dr. Dow said, I would love for this to be a conversation, so feel free to raise your hand, and if you have any questions or post something in the chat, I have the chat open so I can watch that as well. Um, I love to interact with students um, and fellow faculty members, so feel free to um, raise any questions that you might have about intellectual freedom, censorship, book bans, um, how and why I became a scholar, what it's like being a professor, any of those things I'm happy to talk about. Um, but the question at hand is why is it important to learn about intellectual freedom as a master's library science student? And I think the answer has to do with our core values of librarianship. Intellectual freedom is a core value, so is access to information. And if you think about it, access to information is really at the heart of everything librarians do whether we're talking about cataloging or um, providing technology assistance, um, reference questions and answers, story time, all these things that librarians do is about providing access or facilitating that access to information. Um, it's really the foundation, the bedrock of librarianship in the United States. And Intellectual freedom is basically the fancy name we give to providing access to information, to protecting people's right to that information. Right now in the United States, that access to information, that right to access information is really under attack. Um, so I think intellectual freedom is always important for librarians, but I think it's especially important right now since 2020 we've seen the number of, number of book challenges skyrocket across the United States. And I can tell you in my research, we see that this happens in all 50 states. It happens in red states, blue states. Um, it happens in urban areas, suburban areas, rural areas. No community is safe from this potential of uh, an increase in book challenges. And so for those reasons, it's really important for librarians to sort of be forewarned and forearmed to know about intellectual freedom, to know that this is a foundational value, what it means, how to implement it in your libraries and how to protect it for your communities. Yeah, that is, um, you certainly um, make, made that very clear in what you just said, and also you make it very clear in your writing. 
about how this topic is the is really the bedrock and the, the centerpiece mm -hmm. of our profession. You know, I know from interacting with our students that many of them have encountered um, uh, challenges mm -hmm. already uh, firsthand, and mm -hmm. uh, some of them have might not have uh, done had that happen to them directly, but but it's very close in their neighborhood even. And so I hope others of you now will feel free to jump in and talk about the importance of education around this matter. Well, it's important to me because I'm in Texas, so um, yeah. that we are, a, one of the center points of all of this. And I don't know if I feel prepared to face a huge mm -hmm. challenge. I don't know if I'm able to, do, you know, I don't know how intellectually or I'm able to do that. So this is one reason I'm taking this course is to do that and to rewrite my policies. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think that's really, um, you touched on two important things. One is to be prepared in advance. Um, we know these things are happening in our communities and schools and public libraries across the country, right? So let's be prepared in advance. Let's think through how we'll respond, the words we can use. Um, if you have librarian colleagues and friends, role play with them. Say, I'll practice being a challenger. You defend this book and then switch. That way you can practice what you'll say and practice a calm demeanor. And then the other thing you said, Angela, that's really important is um, updating policies, making sure we have good policies in place, because that gives us something to to fall back on, to ask as sort of a, um, oh, what's the word, to act as like a backstop, something to help protect us and say, I'm not just doing this out of emotion or malice or any anything like that i'm doing this because it's the formal official policy this is how we handle things here i have one more question about policies in terms yeah. of intellectual freedom or you know as part of the collection development policy my board wants it to be as vague as possible but i don't think i don't know that doesn't feel right it seems like library policies are pretty specific mm -hmm. so what's your take what what way should we go with that is there a mm -hmm. You know, I've been reading everything and trying to incorporate all the best practices into it. So I don't know whether to go vague, which I don't want to go vague or, you know, detailed. Mm -hmm. um, I think in a, like in a collection devel development policy, it's a great idea to be detailed and specific. Here are the attributes we're looking for when we collect books. Here are the principles that guide us in collection development. And then you can always say, well, I understand you don't like this book, but it meets our criteria for collection development. Here's A, B, and C, right? Um, intellectual freedom, I think, is a bit of an abstract principle. So I think it's okay to be a little abstract in your discussion of it. Um, but you can always tie it to things like the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, um, ALA policy, state policies. Um, and then um, you can get into specifically what that means and how your library will handle a challenge or things like that. So I think it's a good idea to go from the abstract to the concrete, I guess is yeah. how I'd summarize that. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm glad you're talking about that, Angela, now, because in this course, uh, one of the culminating assignments will be to direct policy writing direct, directly. And so students know it's coming up. They're learning a lot of um, details, uh, definitions, mm -hmm. concepts, and terms. Um, we've uh, just covered an assignment that uh, addressed uh, all of those um, court cases that you uh, provided the citations for, yeah. and um, and their de the decisions that were were made in those. You know that doesn't tell us how to write policy directly, but it certainly gives us a clear indication of what uh, both challengers and defenders uh, ha have to, um, to hold on to. And I want to jump in there and just add that um, the long history of court cases 
about freedom of speech and about intellectual freedom should give us strength and courage. This isn't just something made up yesterday. This is a bedrock principle, not only of librarianship, but of the U.S. itself. This is a, a foundational value of the United States, freedom of information. And when we're defending intellectual freedom, we're defending freedom of speech. And that should give us some courage as librarians. I think so, I think too. So. Uh, I, it does give me courage. I yeah. And I, I want, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not, I hope to never have to uh, address this in, in the court. But mm -hmm. I, I certainly do believe that we should be prepared to, that we should be very knowledgeable and be able to, to do our best when we're called on to do that. And so this course is really focusing with that intent in mind is to help people to be prepared and, and also to educate other people, mm -hmm. uh, other people in the library and in their community when they have an opportunity about this matter of freedom of speech as, as it applies to what we call intellectual freedom. Yeah, and I think there are a lot of ways to do that education, right? One is your library board, your board of trustees, the school board, whatever the relevant party is that sort of governs your library. You can be interacting with them and talking about what intellectual freedom means, why it's important and kind of get them on board so that if a challenge does come, they're starting from a good place already. Yeah. Um, you can even educate the people in your community, your neighbors, um, people at your faith organization, people at the Little League baseball game. If the library comes up, you can talk about how important access to information is. Um, you can talk about the fact that everybody can find something at the library, and isn't that really cool? So you can plant these little seeds in people's heads, um, you know, in multiple situations and, and scenarios. For sure. We have a good question here in the chat. Do you see it there, Shannon? Yeah. The policies we need to be concentrating on. Collection policies, reading policies, book reconsideration policies, board meeting, public comment policies. Are there other types of policies we should be looking at? That's a great question. Um, I think those cover the main issues. The other one I might throw out would throw out there for you to consider would be meeting room policy. If your library has meeting rooms that people can um, check out, reserve, it's a good idea to have a policy specific to those meeting rooms. Um, are there limitations on who can reserve them, for how long, for what purposes. Um, there's all sort of guidance, sorts of guidance from this on this from the ALA. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some court cases about meeting rooms. So if you have a lawyer on retainer or um, somebody on your board who's knowledgeable about this sort of thing, they can bring in some of that expertise as well. But there have been some issues with meeting rooms over the years and in, in a variety of libraries. So that's another good one to keep in mind. Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up. We have talked about that. And um, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But one of the things about the ALA uh, 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 intellectual freedom manual that is that it's such a good tool. It, mm -hmm. It's real. We're in the 10th edition now. That was just published, mm -hmm. I think, in 2023. And it is it's written to be to be like a guide to us about what to do. Yeah. And um, I would highly recommend that people have access to it, have one or mm -hmm. have access to it. And when you know that the issue of the meeting room, for example, is going to come up or the issue of filters on mm -hmm. on. Um, on uh, on computers. Uh, those are kinds of things that do come up from time to time. The people who bring it bring it up don't typically know nearly as much about it as we do, but they want to they want to have something to say. So it's important for us to use that manual as a way to understand what what really is possible or not. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really great. And somebody else added that um, there's policy and guidance about using the Maker Lab. I think that's a great 
another great policy to add in. Stan, it looks like you have a question or comment. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, well, I'm currently on the faculty here at SLIM, but also as okay. a practitioner, I am curious to hear your take on how libraries can balance, you know, their inherent commitment to the freedom of information mm -hmm. with the pressures to, to do censorship and control information access, which is especially evident in the digital age, I think. And also I yeah. teach community needs analysis from time to time. So I'm curious okay. if the approach to finding this balance would be different depending on whether it's a more conservative area versus mm -hmm. more liberal uh, geographical area, if you will. Yeah, yeah, great question. And actually you said two words that are really key to figuring this out, which is community needs. Um, I like to tell students and librarians that um, every community has diversity in it. Some communities, it may be racial and ethnic diversity, um, but even the most homogenous community, the one that looks very homogenous and all the same, there's difference in education levels, socioeconomic status, different religious religions are probably practiced or not practiced, right? Um, some people are vegetarian, some are not. Um, some are night owls, some are not. Now, these are not all protected classes, of course, but there's a variety in every community. I think that's really important to acknowledge. Yeah. Um, and then we can start from there and say, okay, if our community has variety in it, our community has some sorts of diversity present, how do we serve that community? How do we serve that diversity? And the answer is having diverse resources, having a broad range of perspectives available, right? Um, so you have perspectives for the person who's a pacifist, the person who's a veteran, the person whose kid just joined the army, all different perspectives. Um, and that's how we serve our community. And that's also how we can defend intellectual freedom and argue against censorship. Um, you know, librarians like to say, this book may not be for you, but it is for somebody. There's somebody in our community who needs this book. And you may not know who that is. I may not know who that is. But let's find a book that is for you. Let's find the right book for you, and we'll leave this book for somebody else. Um, so I think that's, I think starting with community needs analysis and, st and starting from the knowledge every community is diverse is a really... Um, great starting point. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about this matter uh, related to what Stan's uh, bringing up. I think this issue of balance. And um, I, I know some time ago, um, we always taught our students never self-censor. Don't self-censor. Don't do that. Don't, don't um, not order something uh, just because you're afraid or don't uh, order something and then hide it in your uh, bottom desk drawer until someone asks for it, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, but in now I, I have to really think twice before I say that to a crowd of practicing librarians because it, uh, self-censorship is a, is a big, broad and sweeping thing. It can happen a lot of different ways. And we're human beings. We're, mm -hmm. we're constantly trying to use our best judgment. And um, yeah, I think we're, I think that right now we have to use our best judgment as, as Stan's pointing out to find where the balance is. One of the things that I read in the course materials has to do with academic libraries and mm and how it is that the ALA even uh, suggests to us that it's okay to have a collection that's a special collection where items might be that are uh, particularly objectionable uh, or might be particularly objectionable. Uh, and so the idea is not to keep anyone from seeing them, but to try to try to try to minimize the the stress and strain and challenges that might come on the basis mm -hmm. of some part of the university's community. 
And I want to note that for when we're talking about academic libraries and special collections, those are often things that are mm, that walk up to the line of pornography, shall we say, or walk near the line of obscenity. Um, those are not things that you find in the typical public library or school library. So I think I think the idea of having a restricted access collection makes sense for some academic libraries. I went to Indiana University to get my degrees and they have the Kinsey Institute there, which as you can probably imagine has a really unique collection um, and it has restricted access for that reason. But the things that are in the Kinsey Institute, you don't find in a public library or a school library. So there's not really a need for a restricted access collection in a public or school library. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, and in this course, we do have people who have interest in all kinds of library types. Mm -hmm. And so we have been sharing uh, somewhat already about how these things are sometimes different from one library yeah. to another. Yeah. yeah. One thing you said, um, I wanted to circle back to about um, self-censorship because it made me remember talking to a librarian here in Kentucky not too long ago. She's a school librarian. And she said, you know, my principal wants me to remove these three books, take them off the shelf. And I'm really torn on what to do. So we talked through intellectual freedom. We talked through serving diverse community because they were all books with queer characters. And in the end, she said, you know, if I, if I don't remove these books, I will probably lose my job. The principal will fire me. And I don't know if I'll be replaced because in Kentucky schools can get by without a school librarian. They're not supposed to, but they do. Yeah. And I don't know, the principal will probably use that funding someplace else. But if I do remove these books, then the students still have a school librarian and I can still serve those students. And I was like, that's, that's a really profound way to think about it. Yes, it is. You know, sometimes we have to lose the battle to keep fighting the war. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the students are better off losing access to three books and not losing access to a librarian. I'm not saying we should all fold when we're faced with a challenge, but it, I want to acknowledge the realities. Like it's a really complicated issue, right? And if you have a mortgage payment and the kid you're putting through school, I mean, it gets really complicated. It does. It does. And and I think that these organized groups that are uh, grassroots, uh, you know, coming up from the grassroots, mm -hmm. well organized, large, powerful, they have the potential to put that kind of pressure on us. And in the past, yeah. when I used to say, "Don't, don't self censor," there that was not a part of the of the equation yeah. at all. Yep. And I think that it's really important you said grassroots. I'm actually going to change what you said a little bit because um, grassroots movements are from the ground up. It's me getting together with my neighbor, with the person down the street and saying, we don't like what's going on. Let's try to change something. But what we're seeing is actually what I call astroturfing. If you think about like um, professional sports stadiums, a lot of times they have fake grass. It's, it's astroturf that they put down. And so these movements are astroturfy movements or fake grassroots movements. Um, they're organized at the national level. They're organized by political elites. Um, if you look at a group like Moms for Liberty, two or three really powerful elite um, mm -hmm. political operatives started Moms for Liberty and started mm -hmm. the database that is behind Moms for Liberty. And you'll see like a Moms for Liberty in such and such town, South Carolina, and it looks grassroots, but it's not. It's actually being orchestrated at a national level. And I think that's important to recognize that what may look like our community in revolt or our community um, challenging the library is often our community being misled, our community being misinformed by people outside the community. And so that's where good communication with your community becomes really important.
Yeah, for sure. I want to, um, I'm glad you brought that up. The minute I said grassroots, I uh, was trying to think of the term that you have or you use in the textbook. And I'm glad you went on with that that part of the discussion for sure. And uh, with us tonight is at least one of our doctoral students, Jamie Becker and uh, Dr. Amanda Hovius. And in one of our PhD classes this last semester, they did a research project that focused on the Moms for Liberty mm -hmm. group. And they're very right. presenting about their research at Elise during the Works in Progress poster session next week are so uh, coming right up. Well, both of them are here and I just wonder if they would be like to speak up and tell us about that. I, yeah, I just actually sent a little message to Jamie to, to, to <laughs> share <surely> this. Just did. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you share some of what we learned, Jamie, about oh Monster goodness. Liberty? Well, I'm first of all, I'll, I'll go with the, the aim of the study. So we went in doing a digital ethnography of Moms mm -hmm. for Liberty, looking at just the publicly available messaging. So on their website, social media, et cetera, news headlines. And um, we're looking at it through the lens of information worlds. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so sort of like looking at Moms for Liberty as small worlds, but how mm -hmm. does that connect to the larger life world? And mm -hmm. we kind of came up with some interesting, so we, we're, uh, analyzing through that lens so through the lens of the social norms the social values mm -hmm. and the information or the social roles and then the information values of moms for liberty and so we do actually separate the national group from the small groups because at the small group level the like the local level they don't necessarily mm -hmm. have the same goals as yes. a larger and, and are often totally unaware of the um, sort of the propaganda and activism that's going on at the national level. Mm -hmm. So Jamie, why don't you go over the the results of our we're, analysis? We're looking, uh, yeah, looking at it like at that heteronormativity. Um, uh, oh, I'm so you're so much more eloquent than I. <laughs> I'm not so, good at this yet. The social um, norms. That's yeah. okay. This is this is an informal conversation. So I know. I'm still working. Practice. I'm still working on my eloquence. I'm working on so, it. So uh, it actually helps us understand yeah. their the the whole like our whole world view and how that is trying to push that onto the rest of us. Because part of the world view is social hierarchy and social and heteronormativity, and they want they want to erase the world of anything that does not fall into that bucket. So that's why they're doing what they're doing. So we have those as the social norms. The social roles are really, they call themselves joyful warriors. Mm -hmm. So it's the protector of children, the yeah. mothers. And this we were drawn to a historical ideology called the Republican motherhood. Mm which comes dates back to to post american revolution where women were kind of seen as sort of the protectors of civ of civic virtue virtue yeah. and over the years over the decades um that kind of is always there but it changes mm -hmm. and this is sort of the latest iteration of the republican motherhood and yeah we, i think that's fascinating Go yeah ahead. and then we're looking at the information values and so, you know, we go into it knowing that they do value information poverty, censorship. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of it because in order to have the the social norms that they value so much, that worldview basically put upon everybody, they mm -hmm. need, we need to have censorship and information poverty. Mm -hmm. The other information value, um, what do we say? Uh, information supremacy yeah so their messaging they want and this is true for many authoritarian governments mm -hmm. and throughout history is that information supremacy is where their message becomes the message mm -hmm. so if if they have and that's what they want to do and then we're actually tying this to project 2025 it's oh, sure. there's so many parallels and we're basically waiting until after the election to write the paper because the the ending <laughs> kind of how we interpret it might change yeah <laughs> yeah on, you know how what kind of um 
how how we kind of approach the discussion of that of the mm -hmm. the article yeah mm -hmm. you know uh, that message uh, that you're talking about uh, Amanda I I think it has become very clear that the message has been spread that mm -hmm. that the idea that knowledge as power is a cultural lie mm -hmm. and that that is something easy for people to say it's something easy for a lot of people to understand at some level and that's one of the reasons why they're so clear about it they mm -hmm. and they say it people say it just about like that knowledge is power is a cultural lie and the fact that they have so many political connections, yeah. which makes it so much easier for them to push policy and, mm -hmm. and to have the money to back it up, to get people on school boards, to, you know, yeah. to get people into onto library boards to try to make change. So that's, I mean, that that's really where we're, we're starting to see these parallels with Project 2025. And a lot mm -hmm. of the things that come out of the mouths of Moms for Liberty We've heard out of the mouths of like um, J.D. Vance, the childless yeah. cat lady's statement uh, very much is in line with Moms for Liberty have been talking about yeah. as Republican women being the the breeders of children and the Democratic women don't have children. And mm -hmm. that's <laughs> and, and so they have to be the protectors because they're the only ones having children. That's the story or the messaging that they send. Yeah. It's a danger, yeah. dangerous thing. Is it any wonder that we need education? Ed education amongst ourselves, education mm -hmm. that we can uh, help to spread to other people. As information professionals, just think of all of the details we've talked about in just since we started at seven o'clock. There's mm -hmm. a lot of lot to learn. And this is our field. This is our we have the right and the responsibility to really yep. know the topic well at a high yep. level and to use our knowledge of it responsibly. And so um, I, I'd, lo I'd love to keep talking about this, but I'd like to move us on to yet another uh, question. And uh, Amanda and Jamie, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm Yeah, so and feel free to, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Dow, feel free to follow up with me. I'd love to hear more about your study. Yeah. For sure, we're, we'll see that they do. <laughs> okay. we're, all, we're all looking forward to that. So the next question I wanted to talk ask you about, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Oakman, is the, about your textbooks. So I'm, I'm asserting that they are really good sources of authority that, that librarians should know about them. And there, there's some differences in them. I, mm -hmm. You obviously had more than one purpose in mind. And I'm wondering if you'd talk about that a little bit, about how you see that they're uh, both good, and, but both a little different. Sure, sure. Um, the first book, Practicing Intellectual Freedom in Libraries, is um, sort of what does intellectual freedom mean? How do we implement it? Um, and one of the things I say early on in the book is, I, I called it practicing intellectual freedom very deliberately because none of us are perfect at defending intellectual freedom. It doesn't come easy to almost anyone. It's something we need to practice. It's something we need to, again, think about, prepare for, um, and, and be ready for that moment when it comes. And then it's um, I go through various topics about how to implement it and various intellectual freedom considerations, such as the issue of copyright. There's a whole bunch of intellectual freedom issues around copyright, actually. And mm -hmm. so it's um, sort of looking at these different issues with an intellectual freedom lens. Um, the second book, um, The Fight Against Book Bans, is a collection of um, chapters by different authors. And a lot of them are librarians or library advocates um, who have been through censorship challenges or who are preparing for censorship challenges. And so they talk about what it was like, what they've done or what they're doing, um, tips for people preparing to face similar <laughs> encounters. Um, and with that book, I really wanted to let librarians speak to librarians. Um, I wanted to let 
um, the voices of those being affected um, come forth and and share their perspectives. Um, so hopefully that book accomplishes oh, that. that really that comes through. It really does. And just imagine how that really helped me to teach the class and help the students who were so interested in knowing about firsthand experiences. It's it's um, one thing to get one or two people to talk to a class. Uh, it's quite another thing to have a whole collection of people such as you've brought together. It would be impossible for us to achieve that. Yeah. So we're we're really it, it really is a great opportunity to hear various different situations and and the details around how how it impacted the library and how it impacted the librarian and yeah. that your writers really were pretty clear about how it how this really does have an impact on both both of those two entities and we yeah. haven't talked about yet tonight about the impact on on librarians, but it certainly mm -hmm. has taken its toll. And there have been um, a number of librarians that just say, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have in my in my long-term plan to do an interview project where I talk to um, librarians who've been forced out, who've resigned, um, who've been laid off, who've been fired and kind of get their perspective about what the fight was like, what they're doing now, what advice they have for people still in the field. Um, I think we're not hearing a lot of their voices, but I think they're a really important segment to talk to. Um, along those lines, there's a, re a really recent book um, called, uh, shoot, I can't remember the title, but the author is Amanda Jones. She was a librarian in Arkansas um, who lost her job. Um, and it's a really great book. Um, so um, it's just good to be aware that these things are out there, I think, um, and that fighting censorship can take a toll. Um, one of the things I always tell library workers is find a way to recharge your batteries, um, practice self-care, and that doesn't necessarily mean take a bubble bath, have a margarita, although if that's you, do you. Um, but Find ways to take care of yourself, um, going for a walk, talking to your spouse, um, getting off social media for a couple hours. We have to take care of ourselves. And if we're in, in administration, we need to take care of our staff, too. Um, I think that's really important to find find ways to recharge and refresh ourselves. Um, remember, we're humans and to take care of, of ourselves. Yeah. Those um, those chapters, too, came from a wide variety of states. Mm -hmm. And related to that, we have a comment Nathan Carr uh, says here, it's super scary. Lawyers from Team Red and Team Blue both smell blood in the water. The only way I succeed as a small like in a small library is to not get sued and waste the public's time and money on legal fees. Yeah, yeah uh, lawsuits <clears throat> can be really expensive and they take a lot of time and a lot of your attention and energy. Um, and I think a good way to avoid those lawsuits is to have really good policies and also to do the groundwork ahead of time, um, making sure your community members and your library board know about intellectual freedom and know about having a di diversity of perspectives in the library. Um, that's not going to eliminate the chance for book challenges but what it does is it it builds like a silent army behind you so that if there is a book challenge um, maybe three people go to the board meeting and they're angry about a book but maybe a dozen people go to the board meeting and they're supportive of the book and so that sort of thing can really make a difference oh for sure and and we know it has from practice mm -hmm from those best yep. practices that you're teaching us about. I think we have time for a couple more questions. So I hate sure. to leave this topic, but let, let, let's let uh, talk about it yet another way. We've been dancing around this uh, matter I'm about to bring up, um, but I think we ought to bring it out uh, in the open right now and talk about mm -hmm. what, uh, what do you think is um, explains 
the challenges that we are seeing today? What what is it that people mm -hmm. uh, find find offensive? Or yeah, what I think they're doing. I think there are a number of ways to answer this. Um, if you look at the books that are most frequently challenged that the ALA has documented, they all fall into one of three categories. They have content that is queer, that contains LGBTQ plus characters or themes. They have content that I call DEI. So they can they have black, indigenous, people of color characters. They talk about structural racism, police brutality, all that falls under the DEI umbrella. And then the third category is sexually explicit. This includes not only things like rape and incest, but sex education books. And if you look at the most challenging books, they're all in at least one of those categories. Um, so these are books that I think these categories of information can challenge um, traditional worldviews. Um, and so some people are really are fearful when their perspective gets challenged, they they react out of fear more than anything else. Um, that's one way to think about book challenges. Another way to think about it has to do with um, since 2020, of course, what happened back then was the eruption of COVID, the lockdown, everybody staying home. And I, I think parents got a, a real window into what their kids were reading um whether it was getting books you know a bundle of books from the public library or sitting down with your kid and looking at what their school homework was i think a lot more parents learned a lot more about what their kids were reading and i think some of them were really unhappy about it mm -hmm. um at the same time social media was just exploding we couldn't go out and talk to each other so everybody was talking on social media and we all know social media can increase agitation, sort of fan the flames. So that compounds the parents being unhappy about what their kids are reading. And then the third thing that I want to bring up has to do with defunding the public sector. And this goes kind of ties into the astroturfy, the national political organization behind these movements. Um there's a big group of people who want to defund the public sector in the United States. And you can see this in decreased funding for public far parks, um, the lack of municipal pools, um, decreased funding for public education or moving that money into charter schools. And we see attacking public libraries as well too. Um, some people have the impression that Funding things for that are just exist for the public good is a waste of taxpayer money, or they want to see that taxpayer money diverted elsewhere, and so um, they're attacking anything that is for the public good, and that's that um, strain of thought also ends up attacking public libraries. Yes, for sure. Those are. Uh, thank you for articulating that. It's, we <laughs> yeah. we need to hear that out loud. Mm -hmm. And we need to really think about those details, um, be articulate about them our, yep. ourselves. And uh, that takes a little time if that hasn't been on your mind in quite that in uh, uh, depth of explanation. Yeah, yeah. So, and so I also, <clears throat> I'm sorry to interrupt. I want to make one other point. Um, when I give talks about this, I tend to note that it's... Um, a right-wing religious perspective that is most fearful of the changing world and the changing demographics in our, in our country. And that sounds politically charged. And I will acknowledge that people from the left and the center challenge books as well. But if you look at the rise in book challenges, they are overwhelmingly coming from the right. I think it's only factual to state that. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, in, in the time we have left, I think we ought to talk about uh, the latest issue, the latest thing that's happening. Uh, uh, it's it's happened in Texas and Florida and other states that well as well. I want to ask you to talk to us. What what are your thoughts about the current po uh, position of those who want to censor books 
um, in publicly funded libraries uh, for violating the government speech doctrine. Yeah. Um, do you mean that libraries, they are arguing that libraries having books on a certain topic is creating government speech? Yeah. Okay. Um, public libraries in particular, and I think school libraries too, um, I believe legally they're quasi-government agencies, they're quasi-institutions, um, meaning that they have some of the some of the legal characteristics of a government agency or institution, but not all of them. They're kind of unique institutions. Um, and I also think that libraries as a whole are really care are or should be really careful to not um take a particular stance or argue for a particular position but instead offer a range of perspectives and let individual patrons pick and choose what they want to read um i don't know if i'm answering your question do you want yeah, to follow it, that up it's a tough, if it's a it's a tough question um and part of it is because I think that the, the decisions that have been uh, addressing this matter of government speech are somewhat vague. And mm. when they are, they leave us in a quandary. Yeah. And so, um, but, but I think that the intent of people who are um, attacking public libraries in particular around this government uh, speech issue they're a part of that movement that just doesn't want any public funding for anything that's the common good. So this, yeah. this, this, they haven't been too successful with book challenges. So now they're trying this. That's gotcha. the way it looks to me. And I'm sort yeah. of not an expert on it, but others are saying similar things as mm -hmm. well. Well, I suspect they will not be very um, successful with this line of attack either because the Supreme Court has been very clear about what constitutes government speech and what constitutes um, restrictions on government mm -hmm. speech. And I don't think book selection policies amount to public to government speech based on um, precedent. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's hope. Let's hope. Uh, you know that could change though if this the if the Supreme Court composition changes dramatically here right away. There's just sure. no telling what what we might have to deal with where that's concerned. Yep. Uh, I um, heard, I read tonight, just this evening, uh, uh, a post from, or a message from the Every Libraries mm -hmm. uh, uh, group. And they said that in Utah, there is uh, an attack on, um, what do you call those little, little, li little libraries? That, little free libraries. Little, yeah. free, little libraries. free libraries. Yes. And so Utah has um, determined that there are 13 books, I think, that can't be in school libraries. And um, so the members of the public, people, just local residents, have deliberately put those books in their little free libraries. Mm -hmm. Now they're coming under attack, and, oh, at, not just criticism, but lawsuits. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think... Um... I think we'll find those lawsuits to be frivolous because um, a little free library is just an individual's freedom of expression. I would, I think that seems very clear to me. Um, <laughs> well, let's and, hope we have people yeah. in positions of authority that will agree with that. <laughs> definitely, definitely. The Utah law is really interesting because there's 13 books that school libraries are not allowed to have and the school libraries must properly dispose of them they're not allowed to sell those books they're not allowed to give them away they're not allowed to put them in storage they have to be disposed of and i think that means throw them away or burn them i yeah. think that's what it amounts to and so here we have a, le a state legislature <laughs> basically telling libraries to burn books that's pretty dramatic yeah that harks back to a much earlier time in our history, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, yeah. We're almost out of time here. The time's really flown by. Yeah. I, is, uh, let me just pause a moment. Is there anyone in our uh, of our participants that have something you'd like to say right now? Please. 
please jump right in if you have a thought you'd like to speak to us about. Is there any hope? Uh, Suzanne has a question in the chat. Is there any hope in the future for right wingers to call a truce to attacking? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the ALA has preliminary evidence that the rate of book banning might have slowed a little bit in 2024. Mm -hmm. It's a little unclear at this point. Um, but that may be an indication that people are recognizing book challenges are not that effective. Um, often there's what we call a Streisand effect, um, where uh, or for forbidden fruit effect, where if you ban this book, all of a sudden everybody wants to read it. We want to know why it's banned, right? We want to know yeah. what's so scandalous in it. Um, and so sometimes these attempts to ban books end up backfiring and increasing popularity of, of those very books. Um, I don't know about a truce in attacking books, but I think if we can get people to understand um you parent your child let me parent my ch children you know you make choices for your family let other people make choices for their family i think that is the best way forward now it's really hard to have those calm and rational conversations in the heat of the moment so we <laughs> have to be having them all along and um we have to try to catch people at the right opportunity to have those conversations yeah Angela, I think you've got a real good question here. I wish we knew the answer. If book banning is not effective, do we have any idea of what their next approach may be? And honestly, I think we're all afraid to imagine what that might be. And I think that yeah. we're facing a reality that, that there might actually be something. Um, yeah, I think the, the, op the options... If book banning is not effective, I think the next options include defunding libraries, which we've already seen them try in some states and some municipalities. Um, getting rid of school libraries, which we've yeah, seen getting some, rid of, some and, states. Mm -hmm, defunding the Department of Education, yep, bringing it back yep. to the states. And if that's how I think they'll have hope of letting the church take over the schools. And Project 2025 says that um, librarians and other people who peddle obscenity and pornography should be jailed. And they have a very different perception of what pornography and obscenity are than what the law says. Yeah. Um, so that is pretty scary as well. It sure is. I'm going to try to help us to close on a positive note, yeah. if that's at all possible. Um, and we You've mentioned several things uh, already tonight about supporting librarians mm -hmm. uh, in facing these challenges. You've said several things that uh, are important ways to support. One thing that I will mention is that most states uh, library organization has an intellectual freedom committee. Mm -hmm. And if they have that committee, then that committee is busily um, making resources and people resources available um, in our state mm -hmm. in Kansas. We do have an intellectual freedom committee uh, as a part of our Kansas Library Association. And we've created sources on the web, the KLA website. And also members of the committee have actually um, left their jobs and gone to where they were needed on at times when there were uh, important meetings to be attended. Um, and and legislative issues going on uh, in in the capital, and so I suspect that's happening all across the country. Yeah. And uh, I think m people in this audience tonight are in many different states, and I really encourage you to, if you don't already know about that mm -hmm. as a local resource, to check into it and see what you can discover about where there are some. Uh, informed, educated, uh, good support services uh, that can actually sort of be on the ground, so to speak, when you need them. I also yeah. just encourage you, if you're listening tonight uh, or on or listening to the recording, um, if you're interested in taking this course, uh, Dean Jung has already said, 
that he wants to offer it again in the spring. And so we'll be offering it for uh, college credit for the master's level program again. And we're also going to offer it for continuing education for those uh, master's level librarians that are practicing and don't need college credit, but who would like to take the course and they'll be able to do that for continuing education credit at a lesser uh, uh, tuition rate. And so uh, we're making as many plans as we possibly can to, to keep this up. And that's fantastic. I'm not sure we could have done it without you, Shannon. So thank <laughs> you so much for, for uh, join up, joining up with the, for the good of the cause and especially reaching out to us. We really do appreciate it. It's my genuine pleasure. As you can probably tell, mm -hmm. I really enjoy talking about these issues. Um, please, if you have follow-up questions, if you encounter an issue and you need to talk to somebody, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email address at the University of Kentucky is really easy to find. I'm really easy to find on the web. So feel free to look me up and reach out to me if you have any follow-up questions. Um, Dr. Dow, thank you so much for teaching this class, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with everyone this, e this evening. Sure, and thanks to all of you for uh, making time for it this evening. Yeah. And so, uh, good night, everyone. Let's stay in touch.